Hi, uh, so I'm Wahid. Uh, I'm going to carry on from where Jardin stopped uh, to talk about the burst buffer. Okay, uh, so why, why would you want such a thing, which is a, a large SSD layer, just to spoil the surprise of what a burst buffer is? <laughs> uh, so the general motivation is that, you know, we see a lot of spikes in I.O. bandwidth, uh, but then this generally tends to be um, a spiky behavior. So people do get bottlenecked by I.O., but um, it's not as if the file system is seeing this level of I.O. contention all the time. Um, so the idea is to have a layer of the file system that can deal with these kind of bursts. Um, but also, as well as um, the sort of contiguous I.O., the really high bandwidth stuff, there's also what uh, sometimes is described as challenging I.O. patterns or bad I.O. patterns by other people, um, which is kind of, you know, large amounts of random reading across a file or high levels of I.O. operations um, and various different concurrency of jobs uh, accessing files. Um, so while um, providing capacity via disks is the cheaper option, if you actually want um, you know, high performance in this sense, uh, then SSD is actually a relatively cheap option. So uh, the motivation is to have uh, some smaller capacity layer that can handle these kind of bandwidth spikes, but provide a larger capacity uh, in a normal parallel file system. And then a couple of other comments here, uh, as Jalin has probably mentioned, or someone would have mentioned, we have, you know, the large, the Lustre file system on Cori, for example, is a huge 30 petabyte uh, POSIX parallel file system where every user can see every other file and so forth. And really, that's not a very scalable model uh, for performant file systems. So the other innovation of these burst buffers is to actually build file systems on demand, which look like POSIX file systems, but aren't shared with people they don't need to be shared with. Um, and the other thing is to, you know, we have this high performance network, why not actually put the storage on that network? So, so the architecture of the burst buffer at NERSC, which is on the Cori system, first of all, so don't try and use this on Edison, is one thing, <laughs> um, is to provide, so this is like a sort of part of the Aries high speed network, and this is obviously replicated several times. Uh, you have compute nodes, uh, you also have conventional I.O. nodes that talk to the Lustre file system that's on a different fabric, on a different network. Um, but you have also nodes that look very much like the I.O. nodes, but instead of ha um, connecting to the file system here, they actually have SSDs directly in them. Um, and then, so that's the kind of hardware, but then there's also this data warp software, because provided by Cray, that goes with this. Uh, that's integrated with the workload manager so that you can actually request pools of storage on the system in quite a flexible way, uh, either to use just within your job or uh, to be persistent across different jobs. And I'll explain a bit about that uh, later. So, uh, you know, there's nothing magic about the burst buffer. You do just see a file system that you can use at the end of it. Uh, but this file system can be striped across many nodes. Um, or it can just be one node, and so that allows more flexibility than this, if this was just a single uh, local disk in each compute node, for example. So if you want a large amount of space that can be seen by many compute nodes, you can have that as well. Okay, so there's a nice picture of what a burst buffer node looks like, and we have still, you know, pretty large capacity considering this is just used for, you know, individual jobs and stuff uh, of 1.8 petabytes over 288 nodes. And just to stress again, this is only available on Cori. Um, so when, when you want to use a data warp, you create an instance. Uh, and this can either be per job, which is only created by the job that uses it. And when the job ends, it's automatically destroyed, including all the data on there. So this is um, still useful because it's um, similar to a local disk or something. You can still stage in the data from the file system, run on it, uh, stage out everything that you want to save that you've produced. Uh, and, but you don't have to stage out things like checkpoints and what have you that are only just for your application as it's running. Uh, but we also provide persistence instances, which basically can be used also by other users subject to the normal kind of uh, Unix file permissions they set. Uh, how long you want this to last is set by the creator. Uh, and this is useful if you want to have something that you're going to frequently reuse in different jobs or perhaps different other people are going to reuse this same data like a database or what have you. Um, or if you have a couple job and you don't want to run it all within one job, so you want to do some visualization on some data produced by a simulation, for example. Uh, but this isn't meant for long-term storage of data. So this isn't a resilient file system. If something goes wrong, you will lose that data. So 
Uh, you shouldn't expect it to be there for a long time. Uh, and you know, at the moment, we're not constrained on space, but potentially we might automatically like expire some of these over time. So don't expect to use it forever. OK, um, so I mentioned briefly, uh, well, no, I don't know if I mentioned, but there are different ways of accessing uh, the data or, or an allocation of burst buffer nodes. So one is called uh, striped mode. So here you, um, uh, you can have you know, several burst buffer nodes and several compute nodes. And all the files that you create on this are striped across all of the burst buffer nodes and visible to all the compute nodes. So this is similar to a parallel file system, but created just for your job or, or in this persistent reservation. Um, and so this creates its own file system, and it also has its own metadata server. But it has just one metadata server for the, um, the whole allocation. Uh, on the other hand, you can have a mode like private mode, where the files are only visible to the compute node uh, that creates them. So this is much more like a local disk sort of scenario. And it's still useful for any of those uh, applications that, you know, that only create data locally and just need a local disk type situation. Um, and then an additional advantage here is that each data warp node is its own metadata server. So for things that are very metadata limited, this can be a good model. OK, so now I come to how to use data warp. Uh, so the main way that we expect people to interact with uh, the burst buffer. Yep. If we use the shell mode, but uh, we don't use it in, uh, during the processing, uh, do we lose internal performances, or there is no problem like, like that? You're saying if, if, you, if you don't need the compute nodes to talk to each other, yes, but you still choose to use shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, basically, probably not. Only in this, for this one factor that if you're limited by metadata, then this is more scalable in that respect. Uh, but otherwise, it's, you, know, you kind of think, this is like, why not always do this? Because you have the option of seeing across the compute nodes, and you also can obviously not share if you don't want to. But, but yeah, the only. And we have seen cases where people have, like, for example, a uh, SQLite database or something that has a lot of metadata operations that actually private mode is beneficial. So, OK, so the way that most users interact with this is via a uh, Slurm job script. Um, so I'll show an example of this in the following slides. Uh, here you can allocate the space you want. You can stage in. You can choose what files you want to stage in. Uh, and then you, you get these environment variables defined, which show you the mount point without you having to guess the cryptic path that it's mounted at. Um, but the, uh, just to mention, which I won't talk more about here, it, there is also uh, an API, a library that you can link in if you actually want in your program to be able to do things like stage out or define what will be staged out and stuff like that. Uh, so there's a C library there, and it's described there, including an example of how to use it. OK, but in terms of the Slurm way of interacting, uh, so this is just a sort of regular fat script. And then it's got these extra things that aren't commented out, but uh, pound DW uh, lines that, that are recognized by, the, um, by Slurm. Uh, so the first uh, so it defines uh, what space you want. So it says you want 1,000 gigabytes, and it's access mode striped. Uh, it's type equal scratch. So the duration is just for the compute job. In this case, it's not persistent. Um, then you, uh, you, know, you might want to stage in some data. So here's a couple of stage in commands. And you can either use directories or uh, files. And one thing to note here, actually, is that you can't put environment variables in the source part of this. Um, that catches people out sometimes. Um, uh, and then you can also define a stage out, which occurs at the end of the job. So this will, even though it's put in the beginning of the batch script, it actually is meant for outputs that you stage out at the end of the job here. Oh, uh, and then I'll just say on, on this line, uh, this is then your application running. And these in there and in file, this assumes that you're, you, these are just example arguments that your application might take. <laughs> They're not, they don't work for all applications. It depends on your application. And you could also do, do something like, uh, change directory into this directory and then run your job from in there if that's how your application works. 
OK, so then in terms of using persistent data warp instances, um, so here you can create something, and then you have to give it a name. And that name you'll then be able to use on subsequent jobs to, to, to access the same space. Uh, you can delete it, and you should do if you don't need it anymore. Uh, but again, you have to do so via a batch job. Um, you can also use interactive, uh, the interactive queue that hopefully people have talked about if you want to, to submit these kind of jobs. Um, and then in order to use it in another job, you just have a line like this, which says persistent DW instead of the job DW, and then the name that you defined earlier. OK, then just to mention a couple of other tools that are useful. One is just a, a slurm command, uh, s control show burst, that shows all kind of information about the available system. These, these are the pools that are available, uh, but also about, your, uh, about allocated buffers that are particularly for you. And it will, for example, be able to remind you about your name if you've forgotten the persistent name that you made earlier. Uh, and then another useful command that you can run, perhaps in your job, uh, is uh, these DW stack commands. Uh, and there's some, a couple of scripts provided here that show you, for example, which burst buffer nodes you've actually been allocated. So if you're, if you're wondering how many burst buffer nodes you have, and therefore how, how, big, how much your files are striped, then you can access it from this command. Oh, so yep, then I talk about striping here. Um, so here, you basically don't have any choice. Unlike with the Lustre file system, you don't have much choice about the striping that you get. It's, basically, it's pretty much only defined by the, um, the space you request. Now, to give you a little bit of control, we currently have two pools, which have a different granularity, as it's called. Uh, and so if you request the same space, it's basically divided up in these granules across the, um, across the nodes. And so if you, if you requested, uh, did I get that? Well, I'm, yeah, I think that probably, the math is still right. So these chains, I had to change my maths uh, from previous example of this talk. But anyway, um, if, yeah, if you request 1.2 terabytes, it will be striped over 14 burst buffer nodes in one pool, but 60 burst buffer nodes in the other pool. So for smaller spaces, you may benefit if you have large files from uh, striping over more nodes. And I think, oh, yeah, well, this kind of shows the performance that you can get at best. Um, so against benchmarks, uh, the burst buffer does very well. And um, you, know, you can get 1.7 1, 1 terabytes per second and, and huge amounts of IOPS compared to the Lustre file system. Uh, and also, this is more stably true. So the Lustre file system degrades over time. So as Jalin mentioned, you're not going to get the 700 gigabytes per second anyway, even at the best <laughs> case. Um, whereas this, you should still now be able to get potentially. Um, but although this is for you know somewhat idealized test. Um, but then there's various performance tips that we have on the, the Burst Buffer web pages that I'll provide links at the end. Um, but you know, one, one simple tip, for example, is, is to stripe your files across multiple B burst buffer servers. As I said, that's only controlled by the space you request. So you may sometimes want to request more space than you need because it, it you know, stripes wider. Um, OK, so the summary, NERSC has a burst buffer for science. Uh, you can get SSD performance uh, and these on-demand file systems. It's very flexible, so it's not just like a local disk. You can use it for big share files, or you can use it in a local disk like way. Uh, but some tuning, the flexibleness of it means you probably have to play about a little bit to maximize performance. So now we're finding the users generally get good performance and a pre pretty stable service, I mean, especially compared to when we initially installed this system. But a lot of the syntax and the error messages you get are pretty esoteric. And you, know, you can't really just Google for all of these things because you, the only place you're going to find is the NERSC website, probably. Uh, and there's, you know, some aspects of the performance tuning may be different to what you're used to with Lustre file system, for example. So you shouldn't just give up, is the message here. As with everything at NERSC, just let us know if you have any problems. Um, and there's a bunch of resources there. OK, I don't know if people have questions. Do we take questions? 